Newport News in Review starts right now. and welcome to this edition of Newport News in Review for the month of April 2011. Springtime showers, beautiful flowers, and a chance to get outdoors and enjoy each and every hour. As spring continues to make its presence known here in the city of Newport News and throughout Hampton Roads, giving us a chance to explore and discover all the many wonderful treasures that are available to you right here in our very own backyard. From plenty of playful parks and magnificent museums that allow young and old alike to open their eyes and connect with the past. And this month we're doing just that as we bring the show to you from Historic Enview Plantation located along Yorktown Road in the Lee Hall section of Newport News. It's a rare sight in the city, a beautiful wide open stretch of rolling farmland and on it a two-story frame house that was built in 1769 by William Harwood. And although it may appear to be just a house, this house and the land that it rests upon has seen its fair share of history for over 3,000 years. By providing Native Americans the perfect place to search for game and water to the numerous soldiers passing the grounds as they made their way into battle over the course of three wars. Formerly known as Harwood Plantation, Enview eventually was acquired by Dr. Humphrey Harwood Curtis, the great grandson of William Harwood in 1858. The young doctor and his wife Mariah Whitaker renovated the old colonial structure and changed the name of the property to Enview, derived from the way visitors were greeted as they made their way down the farm lane to get an Enview of the house. But tranquility and the couple's bright beginnings in this quaint little house were abruptly interrupted as the peninsula became one of the first battlegrounds of the Civil War. In May 1861, Dr. Curtis left his medical practice behind and raised an infantry company known as the Warwick Beauregards and greatly aided General John Bankhead Magruder with knowledge of the local terrain as they engaged in battle. But as the war waged on, fighting and disease took its toll, and Enview was briefly used as a hospital. By early May 1862, the Confederate Army withdrew towards Richmond. Captain Curtis was discharged from the Army, and he and his wife abandoned Enview and moved to Danville, Virginia, and stayed as the war continued on. The Union Army eventually took control of the Lower Peninsula up to Williamsburg, and by 1864, the end of the war, Dr. Humphrey Harwood Curtis regained possession of the plantation and finally returned to Enview to practice medicine and manage the farm until his death in 1881. Enview would remain in the Curtis family for another century, until it began to show its age and was in desperate need of being saved from deterioration and possible future development. So in 1995, the city of Newport News purchased the house and remaining property and worked tirelessly to restore the historic plantation to take Enview back to its original configuration. And in doing so, a museum was born. And over the years, the Department of Museum and Historical Services has led the charge in helping to breathe life into this very historic place by providing informative tours of this fine museum to the public, giving school children from Hampton Roads and beyond a chance to jump out of the classroom and right into history with on-site field trips. And if that's not enough, the sights and sounds of a Civil War reenactment on these historic grounds year after year have attracted the curious as well as some pretty serious reenactors from far and wide to remember those who valiantly fought for the freedom of this country and to open the eyes of the young and the young at heart as they relive an important time in history that helped establish these fine United States of America. And it all takes place here on a beautiful stretch of farmland with a pretty historic house that continues to serve as a vital link between the past and the present and always looking towards the future for ways to bring history to life here in the city of Newport News. We are proud to feature historic Enview Plantation as it plays a very important role in marking the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And we encourage you to take a step back in time as this fine museum and all the many wonderful programs that it puts on throughout the year continues to do its part to keep history alive for generations to come. Well, April has been another busy month, so let's take a look at what's been going on right here in the city of Newport News. The wind you may not see. 
but the speed and momentum of these simple pinwheels are helping to generate a strong message about children here in Hampton Roads and across the country. Suiting up, gearing up, and well prepared for whatever comes their way as one local department puts their skills to the test and shows you a side of their services that could ultimately protect you when a potentially deadly situation arises. And it's time to dig in, get to work, and come together as the spirit of volunteerism and giving back to the environment comes alive here in this city thanks to a unique program that is truly making an extreme difference statewide and helping to turn the tide in improving the health and vitality of the mighty James River. Everyone and everything needs a little help sometimes. And although at first glance, the situation can be quite overwhelming and appear to have no clear cut solutions, sometimes the answer may lie in having the right people in place who are truly committed to making a difference. And when it comes to the environment, and more specifically, turning the tide to help improve the health and vitality of the James River, well, the city of Newport News, the James River Association, and several hundred volunteers from all over the peninsula were up for the challenge as they recently came together for an extreme stream makeover project that began with an opening ceremony at Denby High School before all the hard work within the Stony Run watershed began. Good morning and it is a pleasure to be here and I really thank you for coming here today because this project that we're doing this week is all about you and the future. So this week we're doing our extreme stream makeover. Anybody seen the television sh show The Extreme Home Makeover? It's a great show, brings a whole community together around uh, a needy family that uh, needs a new place to live. Well, we've taken that concept and applied it to streams. We're bringing the community here at Newport News to focus on a needy stream, Stony Run, to help improve its quality and contribute to the restoration and protection of the James River. We're gonna be doing a project right here in Denby High School, but we've also got projects going on in different parts of the watershed the land that drains into the James River. Digging up dirt, moving rocks, hauling soil over here. I mean, it's some backbreaking work out here that they're doing. And all for a great cause. Here at Denby High School, this courtyard has been here for ages. I'm not sure how long the school's been here, but um, we have tons of hands right now, so it is, we're gonna get a lot done this week. Day is beautiful, you're out in the sun. We are installing several different things that the students are going to be able to use as an outdoor classroom situation so that it can support what they're learning inside. Well, we're creating a series of rain gardens, of landscape areas, some of which are going to have some plumbing components that will help filter the water so it will percolate down through a soil, engineered soil mix, and uh, go into these under drains and then into the storm drain system. You know, you're outside, you're working with your hands, you get to see something that, you know, you're not just writing memos and uh, regulations and things like that, you're actually working on the ground. It's great because it's not only just installing something, but you're able to teach all the volunteers about the things that we're installing. It's a really an outreach thing as well and a finished product that makes everyone happy and you're doing it for a greater good. Well, we're at the Grissom Public Library here today, and we are doing a rain garden. The purpose of this is to catch the runoff that comes off this parking lot. And what the city of Newport News has done for us is to make some curb cuts. In other words, just cut out some spots in the curb that will let the water drain off, not into the sewers, but into this beautiful rain garden we've done. The James River Association works the entire length of the James River, from way up in the mountains to all the way out to the bay. And we're a very small organization, a nonprofit organization, whose mission is to protect the James River. We also want to teach people about the importance of protecting the river and the things that they can do. In fact, a project like this, you could do at home on a small scale. And yes, everything we do, we really rely on volunteers. The Master Gardeners are not a digging group per se. We are an extension of the Virginia Extension, so we are an education group. Wherever we think that we can start a project that will be helpful to the community, we have a tremendous emphasis on trying to keep our areas green, to just not throw everything away, dig everything up, and be through with it. So anywhere we can help, we are always willing to do that. Yeah, yeah I got to tell you, it's actually very important. 
We're committing basically 10 to 12 people a day, so we have five teams out here all week long. So as a corporation and as a local industry, it's, it's very important for us to be giving back to the community. We do a lot of adopt-the-spot programs with James City County as well, cleaning up the parkway, working on the James River as well. So this is all about the James River Association today, and it's a great opportunity. And of course, Anheuser-Busch appreciates the opportunity to come out here and support our community. We're moving a lot of mulch today, a lot of plants, as you'll see. Right. Doing some planning. Everything you do on the weekend, we get to do during the week today. We're all committed to keeping our waterways clean, and, and this is definitely one way to help filter out some of the pollutants that can make it out there. So, you know, it's good for the quality of the people that live around here, as well as the people that enjoy the water. At the Stony Run Athletic Complex, the main goal is to treat the water that's coming off of the parking lots. Because right now, out here, there's a lot of grass, which helps, but doesn't do everything, and a whole lot of pavement. So we really want to get the water off of the pavement into the vegetated areas. So these sites are designed to capture that water. It's going to catch a lot of the sediment. It'll catch the oil and the grease and stuff like that. The plants can take up some of the excess nutrients. They take up some of the water. And then because we've excavated them and we've put special soil back into them, we're really making it easier for the water to get back into the ground. And that's the whole goal here. Every little thing that we do does help. So we love doing these projects. They take about a year to plan and get everything lined up but then to have hundreds of volunteers come out during the week and really enjoy uh, getting their hands dirty and, and hands-on projects is really a thrill. We are seeing the future and the future is now. And you know, it's important to understand that these are gonna be the types of things we're gonna need to go out to the public in the future and there's going to be a, uh, a real environment of shared sacrifice here insofar as trying to address what needs to be addressed given the limited funding environment under which we're currently existing and uh, it does, in fact, start with one person on the ground uh, doing what they can do to help the environment. And uh, hopefully that gets to be contagious insofar as spreading the word and, and letting people get involved in these types of projects that, that ultimately, taken comprehensively, will help us out to meet our future permit goals and requirements and, and ultimately restore the bay back to its better health. No one said life would be easy. And for that matter, the job that stares you in the face each and every day. But when you have the responsibility of protecting the public and going into high pressure situations that only you can handle, well this job becomes more of a mission, involving a highly specialized team that constantly focuses in on training so that when called upon, they are well prepared to suit up, gear up, clear the air, and get a handle on a potentially deadly situation. And it all begins right here at fire station number six in the Oyster Point section of Newport News. We are the Newport News Regional Hazardous Materials Team. Well, being one of the regional hazmat teams in Virginia, we are a level three team, which is the highest level you can get. And we are one of the top level three teams, most highly trained. And we are a self-contained hazmat team. Many of the teams that are in the different regions in the state are made up of several different fire departments, but we have the unique ability that we're able to pull together one department to be this regional team that covers certain areas within the state up towards the Henrico line, James River, to Westmoreland County. Training for the everyday job of firefighting is very important. We have a good training program set up in Newport News and where we're able to simulate fire situations, medical situations, so that's very important on that side as well as it is on the training that we're able to do on the hazmat side to prepare us for that type of incident. The training doesn't just start here though. Our training actually starts on a state level and where each member of this team has to go through several weeks of chemistry, several weeks of, of a highly of technical training. And then once they come here, we have to do continuing education that's required for us to maintain our positions as hazmat specialists. So that's where this training comes into place. Officer Burke. Copy. At 0800 this morning, we had a report of a chlorine cylinder, a one-ton cylinder leaking. Get you ready for the call in case you ever do have it. You know, we don't want any hazardous material call to happen. We're going to have to go in there. We're going to have to stop the leak. I'm not sure exactly what's leaking on there. You're going to have to go in there with your kit. But uh, if you do have one, you know, you need to be ready and be able to respond and to mitigate the situation as quick as you can and as safely as you can so you can protect yourself, the public, and everybody else around. First time I got in, I was a little antsy. I ain't gonna lie to you, but uh, you know, once you get in it, you get your comfort zone, and it's not that bad. Um, it's 
stress level is a little bit higher inside the suit, you know. Uh, some people are claustrophobic. If you're claustrophobic, it's not the team you want to be on. The more times you put it on, the more comfortable you get with it. So if it does ever really happen where you really have to have to go on that scene or that call, you're, you're well prepared with all the training that we do. It's pretty intense, you know. You're going through in there and you got all different scenarios running through your head the whole time you're walking up into the hot zone and then once you find it and you see what's going on, then everything kind of calms down for you and you, you know how to mitigate the situation then. It is always extremely important to keep practicing this, and the repetition is always going to make you a lot better at, at performing these scenarios. Uh, we try to mix it up as best we can, however it does get to be where it's a routine over time. However, if you don't do it within a certain amount of time, you'll lose the ability to be able to perform. So we try to practice this on a routine basis, that way the guys never lose their skills and they stay sharp on it and uh, they'll be able to, when they're called upon, to be able to perform those skills. And uh, we also try to make it fun, try to give the guys a time limit, try to see make, make them improve their times and uh, that way they are quicker with it. All aspects of our hazmat is, are, are important. It's just as important as fire training and also EMS training. And uh, a lot of people don't know that the hazmat team has a lot of areas that are of expertise. Uh, we have a lot of guys that are focused on instrumentation, a lot of guys that are good on computers, a lot of guys that are good in mechanical wise, putting on suits and being able to work with equipment. So we have to be able to train on all of those aspects and bring our guys up to a level that all of them can perform no matter what role that they might be put into. Uh, the decon role, that is, an, that is something that we do take for granted. However, this is something that we also teach firefighters as well. So we all have to be proficient on it and perform that role whenever needed. The hazmat team is a huge component uh, within the city and it's a great, it's like an insurance policy. You're great to have it if something was to happen. Uh, these guys work very hard. Uh, they train uh, every day that we're here during the month. We train and we're prepared. And, and I think that this team is one of the, the, the best in the region and uh, be able to handle anything that's, uh, that's out there. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And when it comes to our children, it's the hopes of seeing their innocence, their desire for love and attention, and our guidance so that they can reach their fullest potential and succeed. But the fact of the matter is, today's kids are actually fighting for their lives. Every 84 minutes, a child is abused or neglected. In 2010, 62.8% of victims of abuse or neglect in the U.S. suffer from neglect alone. You know, there are so many things in this area that could be fixed, but this really gets to the heart of it because people are literally seeing what's going on and how they can stop it. Every six days, a child aged 19 or younger is murdered. We're trying to raise awareness for Child Abuse Prevention Month, and the signs around here tell people what they can do if they know of a child who might be a victim of child abuse and stuff we can do to help them. And the pinwheels kind of represent like a child because you know they're like toys so it'll you know attract people's attention. This is the second year that we've done it. Uh, last year the idea came and you know we weren't sure how it was going to go. We started off with about 25 of these little wooden people and about 500 pinwheels and believe it or not it took off and this year has gotten bigger and we're hoping that next year it gets bigger and bigger and uh, as a result of what we did here last year, Chesapeake is doing it, and there's a community up in Northern Virginia. They wanted information on how to do it. So we just want everybody to see what we're doing, to see the message, and to get excited, and, and to really think about children. And they're our future, and we need to protect them until they can protect themselves. You know, every child is, is a precious gift full of promise and potential and deserves to be loved, cared for, nurtured, and to feel secure and free from neglect and abuse. We are here this evening to open the Silent Children's Garden and to renew our commitment to protecting our children. Our grandson was shaken at the age of six weeks. He lived to be a little over three years old due to his initial brain injury. He was at MCV Hospital for four and a half months. He had cerebral palsy, epilepsy, cortical visual impairment, scoliosis, pseudomonas, osteoporosis, all from the initial brain injury. He passed away on December 11, 2009. And for people who have lost their children to abuse, um, 
there's nothing that ever fills that hole. So when events like this happen, um, you are honored to be included because if we can help save one child, then it's worth it. They say past is past, but you certainly can't live for the present and for that matter the future without learning from what once was. And that certainly is the case here at Enview Plantation throughout the year, thanks to its unique programs and eye-opening events that breathe new life into history and inspire young and old alike to experience what life was like centuries ago. This house has been sitting here for, for hundreds of years. It's seen many people. They say if, if these walls could talk, then they could really tell stories, and this house definitely could. And it, not only is it important for us to get your casual visitor off the street, it's also important for us to grab that next generation of people that will be interested in, in history. And, and the way that we do that is through our Civil War educational programs. While you are visiting with us, we are going to be taking you back in time. It's not going to be 2011 anymore. The year is going to be 1862. We do have all the fifth graders in Newport News either come here on site or we go to their school as well as a number of other schools in the Hampton Roads area. My name is Mrs. Curtis and I am so glad that you have come to visit me. We'll come here and basically what we do is we try to give them a perspective of life at that time period both for the people that stayed at home and also the soldiers that had to go away and, and fight. And so for these kids to come here and to be able to see somebody dressed up and to talk to them, ask them questions. And uh, typically the, the people that we have dressed up, at least the ladies, they are acting as somebody from that time period. But do you think that we can grow absolutely anything that we want to just because we like it? You're right. So these kids really get a different perspective. You know, they're, they're used to um, sitting at home watching TV or listening to music, playing video games, and they have no concept of what life was like before those things and how much different it was um, and the types of work and, and other things that would have been part of your daily life. For us, I can speak for our family. Mr. Lee will take um, probably one of his slaves, a man, that can help load and unload and, and do the physical labor. Well, we're just talking about how it was back then and like um, like the wars going on and how it affected people's life and just feels good to like learn, hands on. They inspire me. I love it when I see the lights go on and, and the fact that they're, they're really understanding and they're really buying into what's happening here. It, it, I hate to say it, but it's good for me. I, I, I love to see them learning. I, I love to see them experiencing what this house has to tell. It's a very valuable program because it allows them to relive that historical period of time as they have studied over the years, especially last year and this year, uh, brings it back to reality and get a feel for how they lived back then and what the experiences were like. And of course it's valuable because they live in this area and they may never really realize that they, are this, they were disclosed um, to the Civil War period and um, you know, how things happened back then. Enview holds a special place for a lot of us because there's very few places that we actually get to be on ground that was traversed by our ancestors. It's special in that respect some of the things you don't get to experience at other locations. Reenactments are a very great way for the citizens of Newport News and other residents of the peninsula and throughout Virginia to come and see how history truly can come alive. Where are you from, boys? Virginia! Where are you from, boys? Virginia! <laughs> We're marking the beginning of the sesquicentennial of the American Civil War this year, and this weekend we are commemorating the Battle of Big Bethel, the first land battle of the American Civil War. It was fought on June 10, 1861. And this weekend we have reenactors from New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, and throughout the country that have come here on the grounds of Enview Plantation to relive and educate the public about this important land battle. Well, I am a retired history teacher, 
and uh, I've been reenacting since 1982. With the 150th coming up, the more people have exposure to our history and realize that, as Lincoln said, those who gave the final full measure of devotion, and again, whether they're in butternut and gray or, or Yankee blue, uh, we owe all those men a debt for what they made America today. It's true. I mean, it, it is a big responsibility. We try to do things the best we can. Um, sometimes we have to uh, make a few little modern accommodations, but we do the best that we can to try to make it as, as realistic as possible. You're experiencing, like I said, in a small degree, what your ancestors experienced. Uh, and it's not so much, uh, you know, us versus them. We're all in this together. And without the other side, none of it would be possible. So we don't really look at those guys as enemies. And I'm, I'm sure our ancestors didn't either because we were, you know, brothers against brothers. You know, we just enjoy coming down here to Inview. Uh, it's a great location, great atmosphere. And, and, and the event organizers down here are great people to work with. Uh, and when you get a relationship like we've had with the folks down here, uh, it's, it's so much easier to do things, it's special. It holds a special, special atmosphere, and it uh, makes you want to come back and bring history back to life. It's a recipe for success, one that you've probably seen before, but never quite like this, with ingredients that were pretty ingenious, cooks that were creative, and the final product, well, quite fascinating. And it all took place not in the kitchen, but rather one of our very own local libraries as the first ever paper birthday cake challenge was a big success at the Pearl Bailey Library in the southeast community of Newport News. This event is in celebration of National Library Week. The teen advisory members and the youth services staff got together and we were trying to plan activities that would be exciting and engaging for young people. And so a lot of the kids watched the Food Channel and they mentioned they like to watch Ace of Cakes and Cake Box. And so we came up with the idea of having a competition, an ultimate challenge of making a library birthday cake. Well, we decided because of funding that we would use boxes. And then Sonia, Scott, and I looked in the closet and we had lots of materials, ribbons, foam, puzzle pieces, old puzzle pieces with missing pieces. And we said, well, we'll use all these materials and let the kids decorate a cake. I knew it was going to be like this, but I didn't think it would be like this much competition towards us. So that's when I knew I had to step my game up. All righty, and tell me what you want to see. Right there. We explained to the participants that they were gonna be judged on number one, the theme of the cake, that it had to be related to the library. And then they could use any of the materials that we had available. Neatness and precision, choice and use of color, creativity. And the time limit, they had an hour and 15 minutes, but we extended it a bit because we wanted everybody to finish. So we went to about an hour and 45 minutes. And they did a great job. I did not know what to expect to walk in here. I wasn't really prepared. And it turned out really good at the end because um, it's all about teamwork and um, determination to finish a product and be glad that you did it. Five minutes. Well, today, just seeing the excitement of the kids, the squeal, the laughter of them going in and collecting the paper and the boxes and some even sketching out what they wanted to create with their cake design. Uh, to me, I think we're missing some of that by just sitting with computers and playing the games. It gives, it allow them a chance to be created. Three, two, one. Yes, when time was up, we tried to follow along with the Ultimate Cake Challenge, and so they had to pick their cakes up and walk them through to the meeting room and set them on the table. First of all, we'd like to give everybody a round <laughs> applause. The most original was number four. It came out with 82 points. Everybody getting together, showing some type of teamwork, some type of team spirit, is always fruitful for the individual and for the community. <laughs> Everyone was a winner. Well, that's about all the time we have for you this month. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of Newport News in Review, as we've helped to bring history to life here at beautiful Enview Plantation, the perfect place to learn more about the 150th anniversary of the Civil War.
And as always, on behalf of everyone here at Newport News TV, whether you're watching us on TV or online, at nngov.com, Facebook, or YouTube, thanks for watching. And we'll see you here real soon for the May edition of Newport News in Review, right here on Newport News Television.